in the summer of 1787, delegates from the 13 newly independent American states gathered in Philadelphia to address the shortcomings of the Articles of Confederation and establish a more robust system of government. Among the pressing issues faced by the Founding Fathers was the question of how to balance the interests of large and small states in the proposed new government, the Great Compromise. The Virginia Plan, proposed by James Madison and others, called for a strong central government with a bicameral legislature where representation in both houses would be based on population. This alarmed smaller states who feared being dominated by the more populous states. In response, the New Jersey plan was put forth, suggesting a single legislative body with equal representation for all states, similar to the existing Articles of Confederation. To break this impasse, the Connecticut Compromise, also known as the Great Compromise, was proposed by Roger Sherman and others. This compromise established a bicameral Congress with a House of Representatives where representation would be based on population and a Senate where each state would have equal representation with two senators. This delicate balance between proportional representation in the House and equal representation in the Senate was a critical factor in getting both large and small states to agree to the Constitution. The Three-Fifths Compromise. Another contentious issue was how to count the enslaved population for the purposes of representation and taxation. Delegates from slaveholding states wanted enslaved individuals to be counted as whole persons, as this would increase their representation in Congress and the Electoral College. Those opposed to slavery argued that enslaved people should not be counted at all. The three-fifths compromise was reached, whereby three-fifths of the enslaved population would be counted for the purposes of representation and taxation. While a compromise, this provision reinforced the institution of slavery in the new nation and granted excessive political power to slaveholding states based on their disenfranchised enslaved populations. The U.S. Constitution established a federal system of government with three distinct branches, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. The legislative branch. The legislative branch, known as Congress, consists of two chambers, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The House is designed to represent the interests of the general population, with the number of representatives from each state determined by its population. Members of the House serve two-year terms. The Senate, on the other hand, represents the interests of individual states, with each state having two senators regardless of population. Senators serve six-year terms, with elections staggered so that only one-third of the Senate is up for re-election every two years. This promotes continuity and stability in the upper chamber. The Executive Branch the executive branch is headed by the President of the United States, who serves as both the head of state and the head of government. The President is vested with significant powers, including the ability to veto legislation, appoint federal judges and executive officers, negotiate treaties, and serve as the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. To prevent any one individual from amassing too much power, the framers established a system of checks and balances. For example, while the president has the power to appoint federal judges, these appointments must be confirmed by the Senate. The president is also subject to impeachment and removal from office by Congress if found guilty of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. The Electoral College. Rather than being elected directly by popular vote, the president is chosen through an electoral college system. In this system, each state is allocated a number of electors, equal to its total representation in Congress, House members plus senators. In most states, the candidate who wins the popular vote receives all of that state's electoral votes, with the exception of Maine and Nebraska, which allocate electoral votes proportionally. To win the presidency, a candidate must secure a majority of the 538 electoral votes up for grabs. While the Electoral College has been critiqued as undemocratic, its proponents argue that it protects the interests of smaller states 
and prevents a handful of highly populated areas from dominating the election, the judicial branch. The judicial branch, headed by the Supreme Court, is responsible for interpreting the Constitution and federal laws. Supreme Court justices are nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate, serving lifetime appointments to insulate them from political pressure. In the landmark case of Marbury v. Madison, 1803, the Supreme Court established the principle of judicial review, which grants the court the power to strike down laws or executive actions that it deems unconstitutional. This check on the other branches of government has given the Supreme Court a crucial role in shaping the interpretation and application of the Constitution over time. After the Constitutional Convention concluded its work, the proposed Constitution faced an uphill battle for ratification by at least nine of the 13 states, as required by the Convention's rules. Federalists versus Anti-Federalists The Federalists, led by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay, were the primary advocates for ratification. They argued that a strong central government was necessary to maintain order, promote economic prosperity, and establish the fledgling nation's credibility on the world stage. In contrast, the anti-federalists, including figures like Patrick Henry and Samuel Bryan, feared that the proposed constitution granted too much power to the federal government at the expense of state sovereignty. They were particularly concerned about the lack of a Bill of Rights to protect individual liberties from federal overreach. To address these concerns, the Federalists promised to add a Bill of Rights to the Constitution as one of the first orders of business for the new Congress. This assurance, along with the publication of the influential Federalist Papers, a collection of essays by Madison, Hamilton, and Jay explaining and defending the Constitution, helped sway public opinion in favor of ratification, federalism, and the balance of power. The Constitution established a federal system in which power is divided between the national government and state governments. The federal government is granted specific enumerated powers, such as the ability to regulate interstate commerce, declare war, and coin money. All powers not explicitly granted to the federal government are reserved for the states or the people, as outlined in the Tenth Amendment. This division of power between the federal and state levels, known as federalism, was a central tenet of the Constitution and a reflection of the framers' desire to prevent the concentration of too much authority in any single entity. Over the course of American history, the precise balance of power between the federal and state governments has shifted in response to changing political, economic, and social forces. The ratification of the U.S. Constitution by the requisite nine states in 1788 marked the birth of a new nation founded on principles of Republican government, checks and balances, and the protection of individual liberties. While the document was the product of hard-fought compromises and intense debate, it has endured as a living document, continuously interpreted and applied to meet the evolving challenges faced by the American people.